Hello everyone, this is Charlie again, and let's go ahead and get started with the plumbing section. And let's go ahead and get that switched out there, that's good. Position myself a little bit better. Alrighty. Yeah. So I'm hoping nobody ends up getting an inspection that that's, you know, kind of this bad. Um, you know, obviously I'm putting this up here as a joke a little bit, but actually this was a house and we did do an inspection and this is what we found. So when we were teaching in the Joliet area, we would use foreclosed homes um, quite a bit. And we still do use foreclosed homes. You find a whole bunch of stuff wrong with them. But on this one, they either the toilet was cracked or for some reason they couldn't winterize it enough to keep the antifreeze in the toilet so it kept leaking out. So somebody thought it was a good idea to take a rag and stuff it in the toilet and hold it nice and tight with a 2 by 4 in there. I'm sorry, I can't keep a straight face when I talk about it. I just think it's so ingenious. Um, it's fantastic, All right? But in all reality, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to deal. Oops, I think we jumped a gun here once. Okay. So there are some home inspectors that go ahead and purchase pressure gauges. Um, you are going to have to memorize some of the pressure numbers that we run into. And when it deals with water pressures. But for the most part, and I know we don't do it, um, there was a short period of time where I did, but we don't put any sort of pressure gauges on any of the water systems at all. Um, I used to have this Toro, um, it, it was a Toro static and a Toro residual gauge together. And it was mostly designed for determining if you had enough water flow to install a water sprinkler system outside for your yard. And, but it did help determine what the static pressure was and also the residual pressures. But we don't really do so much of that here. Um, we're more concerned of the term functional flow. Now that functional flow in the home inspector business does have a definition. You are expected to know the definition of functional flow. All right, so when you're in the same room, such as a bathroom, you should be able to have two fixtures, two fixtures running at the same time, and there really shouldn't be uh, any sort of noticeable loss when one is turned on and the other is turned off. I think we've all heard that joke where somebody's in the shower and then someone else flushes the toilet and they end up getting burned, you know, on there, and we all giggle over it, and it does seem kind of funny in its own way. But we really don't want that to happen. So I have had a, a situation, and I want to say this was over 20 years ago. So when I did this test originally, I would turn on the water to the, to the shower or the bathtub, usually just shower. And I turn on the hot and the cold water when I'm doing that. And then I would flush the toilet and see if the water flow changed. And then I would turn on the hot and cold water to the sink and see if the cold, if the water pressure changed. And nothing changed during some of the inspections that I did. And then one of them I got a real I got a phone call which was a little eye opening for me. And it, it's my house still does it. I love it. Um, and I it, and it does happen. That is true. But sometimes we have to look at it and see how bad is it. Um, so I did have one house where the people ended up hiring me. I did what I normally do. They move in and their hot water pipes were corroded and they didn't have any flow coming out of their hot water pipes. And because I turned the hot and the cold water on at the same time and I didn't check for temperatures or anything else like that, I didn't know better You know, back then. We, we tend to learn the hard way, which is some of the stuff that I try to share with you you know, these are mistakes that I've made or I, or friends of mine have made, and I kind of don't want you to make the same mistakes. So, you know, I, the hot water had galvanized pipes on it, and they were corroded up where the hot water wasn't flowing. 
But I didn't recognize that because I had the hot and the cold water running at the same time. So now our process is we run the hot water only in the shower and then we you know, run the hot water in the sink and see if it makes a difference between the two of them. And then we do the same thing with the cold water and flush the toilet with the cold water. Um, whenever it is a low water flow, one or the other, make sure my clients are aware of it. And that point in time, we see if we can even get a hot shower out of it. Um, you know, repiping, repiping houses isn't really a cheap thing to do. And it's not saying that we have to be responsible for it. But um, at this point in time, I really feel that I should have done it a different way. So functional flow. Uh, two fixtures in the same room in use at the same time without any sort of significant drop from either one of these things. Service pipe. Um, in our SOP, we have to describe the material of the service pipe that's different than the supply lines. So the service pipe is what comes in from the street, and that's usually where it stops at the water meter. After the water meter, those are going to be our supply lines inside the house. So it's basically copper, galvanized, plastic, lead is a very common one in our area. Um, copper, I think, is pretty easy to identify just because it's copper colored. Plastic is also pretty easy to identify because it's plastic. Typically, those will be on a well system, at least in our area here, they will be. Um, we do have some galvanized uh, pipe. Uh, for supply lines coming in there, but that's very rare um, in our area here. Now, the, the biggest clue, if it's galvanized, and it would look kind of like lead as well, galvanized is not soft temper. And anytime I use the word soft temper, I'm talking about something being flexible. If it's hard and stiff and not really bendable or flexible, that's hard temper. So copper comes in both hard temper and soft temper. Some things, if we bend them, they'll kink. Other ones, like gas lines, come in a coil, and we can straighten those out. Lead, I'm not aware of any lead that was ever hard temper. Uh, lead is a softer material, and most of the water lines coming into that are bendable, that are silverish in color, are going to be lead. The telltale sign for a lead pipe is going to be that egg shape at the end. But even with that, um, in Chicago, they're making a big push to put water meters in all the houses. So they're actually cutting that egg off, and there is no more bulge or egg-shaped thing at the end. It's just straight on, and then the, then the valve, and then the water meter that's there. So if the pipe itself is curved, it's probably going to be a lead pipe. If it's hard and straight, it's going to be a galvanized pipe. Just a little chart about when things were used. Um, so it was kind of all the way up to the 30s, and I think it was more into the 50s and 60s in the Chicago area that we kept using lead pipes. Now, one thing about lead, if you're not familiar with it, and, and it does really affect uh, younger people, pregnant women, things like that, they're very concerned about it. So doing a little bit of research in your area, finding out how what the lead ratings are. You know, in Detroit, it's going to be one thing than it is in Chicago. Um, I forgot the name of the chemical that they were putting in the water, but it creates a coating on the inside of the lead. And that coating has really done a wonderful job at keeping our, our lead levels low in our drinking water here in Chicago. However, as I mentioned, they were cutting the pipes to put the new water meters on. And when they did that, um, they basically disturbed that coating and those homes that they started putting those water meters on were getting really high spike levels of lead in the water. Um, so much so that they actually stopped that program where they're putting water meters in the houses, especially those with lead pipes in them. All right, so they're not doing that anymore. Um, the cures for lead water services, if you go ahead and put in um, a new water line coming in there, you might be looking at 15, 20,000, and it might even be more depending on the run to get to the street and the tap in. They're going to have to bore underneath the house. Typically, the new line is going to have to be 10 feet away from the waistline, so it's not going to be in the same trench anymore. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a big deal. 
I um, and since most of the homes in this area do have, or I should say, older homes do have lead service lines, you know, I kind of explain to my client just treat them as if it is. I don't even encourage testing for lead in the water anymore because if I don't get that water sample that's right there that was in the in the pipe for like 24 hours or so then I'm not going to get a good sample it might come back negative and I don't want to give my client hope saying oh I don't have a lead problem here because it came back negative well that may not be true the water might have only been sitting there for a minute or two or just passed through it in which case we're not going to get any sort of lead readings from it uh, just because the water hasn't been there it's got to leach into the water overnight so I'd rather people treat it as if it is a problem. And you could purchase filters with, you know, that are about $150 a year to change them. And so it's doable. There's management stuff. And if they want the permanent fix, then they're going to have to start looking for a house that doesn't have a lead service line. Most of the stuff that we have here in the Chicago area are going to be copper service feeds. Um, well systems will either be a cross-stitch polyethylene or a PVC. Um, we don't really do too much with polybutylene anymore, but nonetheless, we're going to classify all three of those as a plastic anyway. Mostly they're going to be in well systems where we'll have copper coming in for the street supply water systems. So again, going back to the water flow, that's going to be our biggest issue. You know, the bigger the pipe, the more water it's going to flow and the less friction loss. The interior smoothness of the pipe is going to create a lot of friction loss. Multiple bends in the pipe are going to create, you know, friction loss and lower the flow. And depending on how much pressure is coming through the pipe is going to be what's going to create a high flow or a low flow. And of course, height. Water does have an elevation or does have weight to it. So the higher we push it up, the lower the pressure that's going to be. When you start getting buildings like um, the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower or the John Hancock building, the taller buildings, they're going to actually have to have reservoirs and areas where they catch the water and then they pump it up the next 20 stories or 50 stories, whatever it is. You can't have a pump that's going to lift it all the way up that high and still maintain a good flow and a good steady amount of pressure. So they actually have holding areas and they fill them up. Um, but in residential buildings, typically we're going to be three stories tall at the most. Um, rarely are we going to be a fourth story tall. Um, and usually you lose on average five PSI per floor. So I, the exact number is 2.2 for every, uh, you lose one pound for every 2.2 feet of elevation. So every 10 feet is what we're rounding up to be one floor elevation, so we just round it up to be five or round it down to be five PSI for every floor. We'll go into the other numbers, what's normal in a second here. Oh, here's, we're talking about the height now. So if we start off with a 60 PSI service coming in from the basement, we go up one floor, we could expect five pound loss is what they're saying here. And that's just an average. And again, we don't really measure the pressure itself. I just want you to know what that is. All right. The diameter, and this one is a little bit of a math problem. Um, this I actually found really interesting, and I had to throw out the old BS flag when it was first explained to me. I'm like, there's no way, you know. But you take a half inch pipe, and they're comparing it to a three quarter inch pipe. And this slide is showing that that three quarter inch pipe is actually twice as big as the half inch pipe, even though it's only one quarter of an inch bigger. And by doing the math, that's the pi to 3.14. If we multiply that times the radius, and that's where the math on the bottom is, you can see the half inch pipe comes out to 0.195 square inches, where, and doubling that would be, well, let's round up to 0.2. We double it would be 0.4. And then you can see on the three quarter inch pipe at the bottom, it's actually bigger than 0.4. So it's more than twice as big. So bigger pipes, easier flow of water, less friction loss, and greater amount of flow. And this is where they're talking about depending on the pressure and the gallons per minute. And friction loss is directly related to the gallons per minute. So the more water flow, 
through the smaller house, the more restrictions we're going to have. And that's kind of what this chart is explaining. I like you to know the term static pressure. That's the pressure of water when it's at rest. It's the potential of energy. So as the water is sitting in the system, we're gonna if we put a gauge on it, it's typically going to be in our area, in the suburbs, I should say, about 50 feet. I'm sorry, 50 PSI to 60 PSI, somewhere in that ballpark. Sometimes it'll be down to 40 and so forth. The way we work our water systems in the suburbs is most of them are with water towers. So we'll have a pump that'll pump the water up into a water tower. And if you remember what I said about the elevation and the amount of pressure that's built up on those things, usually those things are about 100 feet in the air or more. So because of which, if we get five pounds per every hundred or five pounds per every 10 feet, that's going to give me 50 pounds of pressure as that water is going to be pushing back into my water system. Not only that, but it acts as kind of like a bumper on a car and it keeps any water from shocking as the pumps are running. So we just keep pumping water into the tower. They could turn more pumps on as needed and turn pumps off as needed, depending on the height of the water inside of the water tower. So they try to maintain a steady static pressure. The reason why they want that to be steady, no matter how much water is being used, obviously we use more in the morning um, as a community than we use during like middle of the day or if there's lawn sprinkling going on versus nighttime. You know, the reason why they want a steady pressure is when you change the pressures of the water pipes in the ground, that actually shocks those pipes. And if they change significantly, um, you can they break the pipes and they break them often. Now, going back to my fireman years, there was something that the water department would complain about the fire department all the time. Um, once a year, uh, we we call it hush and flush. We would have to go out to all of our hydrants and open up the caps and flush all the water out of them and spray all the valves and the the threads and the caps and everything with. Um, a little bit of lubricant and put all those things back together. But opening up those hydrants allowed a significant amount of water to flow and then shutting them down uh, created a pretty strong water hammer on things as well. So that would actually shock our pipes. And um, yeah, I really, honestly, I felt bad because it was like almost every time, especially in certain neighborhoods where the pipes are really old, um, yeah, we would bust those water pipes all the time. And in doing that, you're talking about get the big machines out, dig down where the pipe is broken. First, we got to shut the water off to the neighborhood. You know, then they're going to put a sleeve on that to fix the leak. Um, in some of these areas, they got sleeves on top of sleeves. They're really bad. But anyway, getting back to what the slide is, static pressure is the pressure of the water at rest, ready to be used.